Hello, and welcome to this episode of Let's Talk Death. I'm Kiri Meyer. And I'm Andy McNeil. And we are thrilled to be your hosts for these conversations. Let's Talk Death is brought to you by Heal Grief, a social support network creating community after a loved one has died. Everything we do is inspired by our core belief that no one should ever need to grieve alone. Our goal for this program is to have a friendly chat with the field's leaders so we can help normalize and educate our Heal Grief community. We are pleased to welcome Heather Servati Saib to our show. Dr. Servati Saib is professor in the doctoral program in counseling psychology at Purdue University, associate department head of educational studies, and associate dean of student life in the Honors College. She is well published in the areas of adolescent, young adult bereavement and suicide, support group and grief and the use of loss as a broad model for conceptualizing significant life events. So welcome, Heather. We are so glad to have you with us today. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Of course. Um, so I've known you for a long time, and I've seen so much wonderful work that you do advancing the research for college student bereavement. So I'm wondering, would you mind sharing one of the most important themes that you've seen surface from your research, which might be hard to choose from? <laughs> Well, absolutely. And actually, in your introduction, you mentioned that theme. And it also came out, uh, it comes out in almost all of the research that we do with grieving college students. And that is the, the risk of that high sense of isolation. Uh, and uh, the challenge of sort of seeking support and also receiving support for young adults. They're in a developmental place where they believe they need to be autonomous and need to do things on their own. And when they experience a death loss, that's a time when everyone needs support and uh, needs to know that they're not alone in what it is that they're, they're coping with. Uh, and it all kind of comes together for young adults and for college students in a way that can be very, very challenging. Um, they often feel quite isolated. Definitely. Yeah, I would think with, I would think with their, their friends that are around them who have not had that mm -hmm. uh, a significant loss or dealing with grief at the time, yeah. uh, that, that seems like it would just add to that sense of isolation that they feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. it really does. And I, I think one of the concepts that we talk a lot about is sort of this idea of a double wall. Because the students, the grieving, the grieving individuals, the grieving young adults uh, have sort of a, a tendency to keep their grief to themselves. I think sometimes because they don't believe their peers will do a very good job at supporting them or they have tried to reach out and their peers literally have not been as supportive as they hoped that they would be. And then the peers are in a position of, in some ways, not being like having the emotional development or even the lived experience to know what could be helpful. And so they may yeah. try, but they also don't have kind of the sort of base of experience and um, sort of emotional wherewithal to kind of have a sense that really what, what grieving individuals need is that presence and that persistent and consistent uh, ability just to be there. And as you were talking about, Heather, you know, developmentally, yes, they're autonomous, but they're also going towards their peer group, right? So, exactly. so what, I think that even, you know, begs a, a, another issue of like, wow, I, I am trying to go towards my, my peer group and I'm, I'm getting that double wall. I'm getting that. So yeah, isolation, the autonomy feels maybe safer than trying to reach out to people who maybe don't get it in a way. Yes, absolutely. And then the interesting thing is if they're on a college campus, they may feel uh, they can't be alone. So they feel alone, but then they physically can't be alone. It's this amazing paradox that we see in their yeah. experience where students will talk about traveling an hour to maybe a place in nature, actually, where they can be alone with their grief. Or they'll talk about how one of the only places they feel free to grieve is the shower because no one else is sort of there, if it's an individual shower, right? I mean, so that they have spaces where yeah. they, even if they are emotive, you know, and cry in their grief, which we know all, not all 
not all individuals do or and not all individuals need to cry um, there's a lot of diversity in how grief is expressed but if that is a part of their need of expression and their their expression of grief it can be really difficult to find a place for that it can also be difficult we found in some of our research for their peers to think about where's a space where they could support them mm -hmm. you know if they live in residence halls where do they go you know, I mean, where do they go to be able to have a, a serious, um, you know, in-depth conversation, knowing that the other person could be safe uh, in the whole range of what they may need to express? And that's a whole nother part of it. I mean, I think the general population knows very little about the range of, of grief reactions, let alone college students. They don't even really know what to expect from their grieving peers. Uh, in terms of what is understandable sort of grief expression, which we know is very broad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the, what is the, the prevalence of college student, college age students yeah. grieving? I know you've done a lot of research and, yeah. and I know there's a lot written out there too. Mm -hmm. um, so the overall figures, what we see, are pretty consistent. Um, and the way I like to talk about it most is if you look at any two-year period and you ask a group of college students, I mean, we don't, we don't have a lot of research on those who are not in college, which is one of the areas where we need a lot more research on young adults and their grief experience. But of those who are in college, uh, anywhere from 35 to over 40% will have had a death loss. Usually we find very close to 40%. In our last couple wow. of studies, that's exactly what we found. Now, the most common death losses are grandparent, uh, aunt and uncle, and friend death. And so, you know, then there can be judgments that made, I would argue, by college student personnel sometimes, that a grandparent death loss or an aunt or uncle death loss is less critical or less impactful for college students, but the research does not bear that out. Um, and actually what we find is that college students are very much aware that any death loss within their family changes the family system. Um, and yep. any death loss that significantly affects their parents or caregivers significantly affects them, even if they didn't have an individually close relationship with the person who died. It changes things, it changes the way they see their parents, it changes, I mean, they're at a, at a point where they may be able to actually support their parents in a way that they never have before. Uh, and so it's very interesting to think, think about, you know, and we actually have less research on those grandparent and aunt and uncle deaths than we have on parent, sibling, and friend death in the literature, um, which is fascinating. We need a lot more uh, research there as well. It's interesting that you bring that up. I, when I actually, my first two years of college mm -hmm. was when I, I experienced the first death in my family. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather was murdered and I had a cousin who died from suicide. Mm -hmm. And both of those had a huge impact on my college experience. Uh, and, and it's interesting you say about the parent. My mother, after her dad died, that was her dad. Yeah. And after her dad died, and in such a, a very difficult way, right, yes. um, I found myself as a college student lacking the resource as her son mm -hmm. to be the support, sure. the support that she needed. So there was that added stress to it. It's interesting yes. that, that you yeah. say that, yeah. Right. And yeah. developmentally, they, you know, college, college students <laughs> and young adults can sort of have this sense that they should have those skills, like they should be able to do that. And in a way yeah. they have some distance from their family, but they still often don't have that emotional development or the life experience development to really be able to do that. Or as you had mentioned, Gary, in some ways, they've already moved away from their parent or they're trying to move away from the parent. So how does that really contribute to their ability to be supported? And so that's an internal struggle oftentimes. Um, and we often hear students who are grieving talk about they never feel like they're in the right place. Like if they're in college, yeah. they should be at school studying. But if they should be at home with their family in some ways, they can feel like and feel very, very torn um, in that yeah. way. And I don't, that's not unique to a parent dying or a sibling dying. I mean, it really is any kind of death loss that significantly affects the family system, let alone, as you were saying, the particular causes of death being, you know, violent and also preventable, which we know is a really, um, 
you know, complicating and challenging part of, of those types of death losses. And while we're seeing this, I think, you know, as, as you two are talking, the, the thing that keeps coming up in my brain is retention, right? We have issues with retention, with people staying in school because of these, whether it's societal, cultural, or even personal expectations that one young individual has for themselves can really impact whether they stay in college or whether they do feel like they have to leave, whether there's lack of support or whether they need to go home to the support, I think that can be a huge issue too. It really can be. And if we think about, you know, bringing in another area of work that my research team does, maybe we think about death losses and non-death losses in terms of the challenging experiences that students have. We know that romantic breakups are a significant non-death loss yeah. that college students experience. And when you think about what about situations where there are cumulative losses that are death or non-death losses, and how are those addressed on campus in a way that students may get the support that they need but that's also challenging because because college students are not that good at raising their hands saying they need that support I mean they they right. don't come out I mean trying to figure out the low barrier ways to really connect with them can be a significant challenge um, but yeah. I do think that colleges I know that Purdue but other institutions as well have tried to create more flexibility around uh, leaves of absence and around the ability for students to withdraw in a semester where they have experienced you know significant life events and then be able to have the opportunity to return when they've had some time away to really cope and sort of um, build themselves up again to be able to come back to the academic setting those, those yeah. are really critical issues, being able to yeah. recognize students as whole people who experience challenging yeah. life events during college. The assumption is often that college is just a time of fun and growth and partying right. um, when we right. have many yeah. students who are dealing with a lot of, of stressful life events. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm, I'm curious even hearing you talk about what, what how did you get involved in this type of research to begin with? What, what drew you to that? Um, what experiences or what, yeah. you know, why, why were you interested in this? And this is, you've done, done this research. Well, I would say in terms of death and dying and loss issues in general, I think it's very much connected to some non-death loss experiences that I had early in my life. Um, in terms of academics, it was really in my undergraduate years that a psychology professor, and I didn't even want to take psychology. I was like a math major, <laughs> philosophy, you know, I was not into psychology. I was wasting time and a bunch of common sense. But my professor talked about a grief conference that he had gone to the weekend before. And I just, it just clicked for me, as odd as it may sound. And I went to him after class and I said, so if I major in psychology, can I do this loss work, this grief work? And he hmm. said, yes. And I said, well, that's what I'm going to do then. And so I did, um, I, I became a psych major. I did an honors project where I did my first research study. Uh, and then I ended up going to grad school to study with uh, a faculty member who was specifically focused in death and dying and, and actually aging issues. Uh, and wow. then for me, the college student work really came out of my interest in identity development and grief a little bit. Mm -hmm. Kind of got to that too, Kiri, in terms of how do you figure out who you are in the midst of a death loss. I mean, so yeah. in Emeyer, they talk about meaning reconstruction, but if you don't have your, your meaning kind of set yet, it's not an issue of reconstruction. It's an issue <laughs> of constructing, you know? I mean, so, you know, you hear people saying sort of that phrase of kind of building the airplane while you're driving, while you're flying it, you know? I mean, and so, these, you know, these young people are trying to determine who they are in the midst of these challenging yep. sort of death losses. Um, and so I did work at the Warm Place in Fort Worth, where I worked with grieving okay. families, and that was during my graduate school years. And I found myself really drawn to the adolescents because of many of these issues. Uh, and then as things unfolded in that area, identity has kind of shifted over time to be more of a focus for young adults than it is even mm -hmm. for adolescents. It really is during the young emerging adult years that there is yep. a lot of this exploration now. And so my research also shifted then to the population of 
of emerging adults rather than adolescents, where, where it, which is where I'm focused now, really. Yeah. Well, and it, you know, you think about that age group and in a way, all of their experiences, including losses, become an integral part of who they become. Yes. Like it, it is about that. that I, it is when you, when you say that, so that it clicks, you know, to think as they're, it, it, to ignore those experiences in their life and assume that it's only their major or it's the, the friends that they have that are shaping who they're going to be mm-hmm. without considering that the losses they have are also part of shaping who they're going to be. That's, that's significant. It's important. We would be missing an entire area we of would. that person's life to better understand how to help them, how to support them, how to move them into their future, right? Absolutely. And one of the things we've seen in our research, a couple of recent studies out of my team, well, are, we're really focused on sense making as a way for young adults to really try to integrate those challenging life experiences into their narrative. Uh, and we have found that the more students can make sense of their life experiences as a part of their story, uh, the lower their suicidal ideation, the lower their tendency to engage in non-suicidal self-injury. Um, really important to offer them the support that allows them to think through these life experiences. And I would argue to consider the gains and the losses that are connected with each of these as a bridge to really helping them to make sense. Because we know in the research college students tend to use avoidance as their primary <laughs> coping mechanism which we, we see does not work well. Um, and so the idea of helping them to really look at these life experiences and break them down and break them apart and really focus their attention on them in a way that is not bringing them down, but in a way that is helping them to understand can make a significant difference for them. So Heather, if, if a young adult is watching this and they're like, oh man, like I want to make sense of this, And yeah, I use avoidance a lot. And I, yeah, I understand that's not helpful. Is there something um, that you would suggest to help them get to kind of start making sense of things? I do think so. in some ways, one of the things that can be helpful, and I know this is biased because our team developed this gain loss framework, um, but what we argue is that most life events involve both losses and gains. And when we're talking about an undesirable, a clearly, absolutely undesirable experience like a death loss, it can actually be helpful to sort of think through what are what are the all of the losses that are connected to this life experience because they can experience a lot of disenfranchisement and some of them, some of that can lead them to thinking, why am I struggling with this so much? And if they can actually lay out all of the sort of physical and non-physical losses that are a part of this experience, it can be sense-making in and of itself that they can work toward enfranchising their experience that may be disenfranchised and they may have internalized some of that disenfranchisement. You know, what are all the ways that this life experience, say this death loss has affected my life and then allowing themselves not to force themselves, but to allow themselves to watch for windows where they may see lessons that they have learned along the way. And some of the lessons that we hear from grieving college students are things like, I really learned who my friends were and who my friends weren't. I really learned uh, more about my purpose in life and the need to be very intentional and very clear about what kind of contribution I want to make to the world. I have learned more about uh, how to help others who face similar challenging uh, life experiences. I know much better now when someone else has a death loss, what I can do to be helpful and supportive to them. And that does not, those gains or those lessons learned do not at all take away the losses, Um, but they can contribute to a process of sense making. Uh, I also think that, that it then contributes to how do I see this as a legitimate part of my life, rather than trying to pretend that it didn't happen. Um, It is not sustainable. I mean, Mm -hmm. it works in the short term, and sometimes we need it in the short term. 
We need right. that denial and we need that shock, you know, that shock to be there and that denial to be a piece of it, but it won't work in the long term. I love right. the idea that so much of that validates you. So it's not just, oh my gosh, wow, like I'm having a really hard time dealing with this. I need to just get over it or move right. on. But wow, I'm validating that I have a lot of struggles going on right now. So it's okay for me to feel this way. Uh, I think that, I mean, at least for my own life, I think that would be a huge thing to do with any kind of difficult situation, but especially a death loss. And it would be odd if you weren't, right? I mean, and, and the, thing, the thing about it too that we know about grieving college students, actually I would argue it for most grieving individuals, but then also most college students or young adults, whatever the struggle it is they're facing, being in community is really very important and very helpful. Um, and so yeah. programs like AMF for grieving young adults and grieving college students are just unbelievably valuable. Of course, the challenge is getting them to come even once. <laughs> I mean, well, once they that... come once, then you know they see the benefit of, of hearing some of their yeah. own thoughts that they have not been able to articulate come out of the mouth of the person sitting across the table from them. There is nothing like that, excuse me, for the experience for a griever or for, I would argue, the experience of a college student, regardless of their struggles, feeling that they're very much alone. Uh, and I think that is a, is a significant point of direction in terms of what institutions can do to help uh, college students who are grieving both death and non-death losses. You know, I, I reached out, um, I reached out yesterday to uh, um, a, a representative from SAMHSA, um, uh, their, their granting arm, and they had some grants that they put out about um, uh, suicide prevention on campuses. And the conversation was interesting um, because when I, when I told her, you know, what, what, field that I worked in and what my interest was, she said, well, you know, these are really prevention grants, not, not grants for after the fact. And so you, people hear the word bereavement, they hear the word grief, and they say, oh, well, that's, you're talking about after something happens. And one of the things that I was able to do in the conversation is to say, well, actually, a lot of, a lot of college students are grieving mm -hmm. over a number of types of losses and dealing with suicidal ideation, even suicidal behavior, uh, all of these pieces and parts. So I guess I'm bringing this up to say, to say one of the challenges I think is, how do we get universities, how do we get uh, counseling offices, uh, mental health support on campus to recognize this, the significant level of, of losses that young people are dealing with and to see that as a, a See, see providing support for that as a necessary component for the you know good mental physical health of students on campus so that's Absolutely. that i think that's a challenge you know it is a challenge and uh, so this will be a roundabout way of sort of answering that but i think about it in terms of our own campus and the challenges here i think one of the things that really has helped is the bereavement leave policy we have on campus because oh, okay. it is it is, it's, it's like a, a multiple sort of benefit kind of initiative. So the bereavement leave policy allows students the assurance that they will be able to make up work for a certain amount of days, depending on the death loss. Uh, I will say that grandparents are counted as immediate family members. So they okay. do get more days for grandparents than they might for an aunt and uncle, for example. Um, but they can petition for more days. But what that policy does is it communicates a general sense to me uh, that death and dying issues are very important and are very cl clearly something that college students struggle with. Um, so those students go to here at Purdue to the Dean of Students office to make use of that policy. And then those students have raised their hands. They have raised their hands and, say, and right. have said, I'm grieving, and they become a group where we say, look at these students who are using the bereavement leave policy. And then for me, I see that as an absolute opportunity for prevention because those students yeah. have already said, yes, I'm grieving. I need the support to make sure that I can make up my work and keep my academics going. Um, 
But what we also found in a recent study that we did is that the students who used that policy gave feedback that they wanted more follow-up. They, they want wow. more follow-up. They want more yeah. support. They want more information about resources. I mean, and that's all prevention-based. And um, luckily, I'm right. talking to the Dean of Students Office next week about how they might be able to act to provide more support to grieving students. But the students want things like they want the faculty to get better training um, about the policy, but also about grief in general. Um, I don't think faculty really view themselves as able to offer support to grieving students, but we also know from the research that it doesn't take much. I mean, all you need to do is to acknowledge the depth of what they're experiencing. Um, and then if you're willing to be able to share, um, as you did earlier, Andy, about a death loss that, that you had, which then normalizes the experience for them as well and cuts down on that disenfranchisement. Um, so I think it's hard for, it's hard oftentimes in a general way for the world to see working with grieving individuals as absolute prevention work, because it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. a, a death is not a catalyst for a mental health condition, but in right. general. I mean, it's really how the death is handled and the support that's offered and whether or not there's opportunity for discussion and reflection um, and really mourning, you know, the ability to really cope with that death loss in a way that is healthy and open and flexible. Uh, and that is absolutely prevention work. I mean, yeah. and I, I have... I, we did have a SAMHSA grant here on campus. We worked with Residential Life to train them around making referrals of individuals mm. who were in crisis, who were experiencing mm. We talked some about challenging life events and how those can contribute to suicidal ideation, but we talked most about how do you remind yourself that, from one of my favorite songs, that we're all just one phone call from our knees. Mm. The, the, the person that's in front of you is just minimally different than where you yeah. might in a few days or a month. And to create, a, you know, sort of a, a greater level of uh, empathy and identification that allows for the referral to actually work, you know, where they, they hear and see that, you know, you would seek services in this kind of situation, that you believe that getting support can make a difference and that the future can be better um, based yeah. on that accessing of resources. Um, it's absolutely prevention. So, yeah. And, and Heather, is it, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, there are a large majority of colleges and universities that still don't have a student bereavement leave policy in place yet? There's just a small minority that, that do. In our last look and in the last uh, articles that we published, we found 44. Um, and some of those 44 are actually within the same system. They're just at separate institutions within that same system. So if you count the numbers in that way, it's even lower than the 44. And I just think it's a significant action that, that institutions can take. I also think a really helpful direction is to be able to work with residential life, who we know from grieving students are one of the very first sorts of lines of connection. Um, we had students in our, in our book, the We Get It book, um, talk about how they just wish that their residential life staff would just have known um, that the death had happened because having to share it multiple times with multiple people is very difficult and the bereavement leave policy what it does now is when a student accesses the, po accesses the policy there is a message sent to all of their faculty indicating that they've had a death loss there is a message sent now in the last couple of years to the advisors the, of that student um, and what we're really talking about now is can it also be sent to a staff member in residential life who has connection with that student? And I really hope we can make that happen. But none of that could happen if we didn't have the policy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. It just couldn't be possible. Mm -hmm. But we do so, need to be advertising the policy more. It's definitely underutilized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we only have a few minutes left. And I'm, I'm wondering those who are watching this, um, uh, this show, uh, if they wanted to learn more about 
uh, your research uh, information maybe about agreement leave policy what how would how would they go about doing that whether it's well we have a we have a couple of recent publications that have come out the one that talks a lot about advocating for bereavement leave policies is, is in the journal of college student development and it just came out this past spring um, and so that's one place to look i do think that um, another helpful resource is uh, the book that David Fagenbaum and I edited with the stories from grieving college students, we get it. Uh, and yeah. I think it's a, it's a really helpful resource for grieving college students themselves, but also for the um, staff and faculty who want to be supportive and also the friends. I mean, I know we've had, yeah. we've had grieving, you know, non-grieving young adults get the book because there are a couple of chapters about how to offer support, where grieving students mm. have offered what kind of support they're really looking for. Um, but also, I mean, I'm a resource, I would be glad to offer ideas. I know AMF has information about grieving leave policies also on, on the site, which is, uh, I think, very helpful. I think AMF is a significant, uh, makes a significant contribution to any campus where a chapter exists. Uh, just by it being there, um, but also clearly yeah. by the programming that is offered. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Well, thank you, Heather. We want to once again say thank you so much for all of the work you do and the advocacy that you do for grieving young adults um, and for AMF as well um, and for being a guest here at Let's Talk Death. Um, so we are so excited to have you kind of on our team for this underserved population. population. So thank you. So much. Well, and I appreciate you inviting me. I mean, one of the things my research team talks about is that our major goal is making death talkable. And so even the title <laughs> of what you're doing is very much aligned. Well, and thank you for that. And those who are, who are watching, uh, if you want to learn more about Heal Grief, uh, you can visit us at healgrief.org. Uh, you can also, also learn more about Actively Moving Forward, AMF, that we've discussed today uh, on the same website, healgrief.org. So Let's Talk Death episodes will air monthly, so make sure you sign up on healgrief.org to receive our newsletter for a link for next month's episode. And with that, thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time on Let's Talk Death.